Welcome back to another episode of Talk Dead to Me, the only Walking Dead podcast with the guts to start at season 10. I am your host, Johnny O'Dell. I'm the social media manager for The Walking Dead. And with me, as always, is Woody Tondorf. Woody, it's just the two of us today. Just us. Like Jack and Sally. Thelma and Louise. Peanut butter and jelly. Lamb and tuna fish. All right. Johnny, yeah. happy holidays. Thanks so much, Woody. This is, it's such a gift to be to be on this show with you. Wow. And and to be able to to share our, our love of The Walking Dead with all of the people who appreciate it or, or don't. Why are you unbuttoning your pants? This is, it's very hot. What the hell are we going to do? There's no episode this week. You're right. I thought we would totally wing it, and then you told me that was irresponsible. So I, I have an idea for the show, and we can, we can just go forward with it. I think for the rest of the show, let's just do a gift guide. Okay. There's Walking Dead items out there. Ostensibly, people need help with their with their shopping for various holidays. So let's just tell the folks about the, the great stuff out there that they can go that's Walking Dead themed. And then maybe an interview with Leslie Chu? Yeah, that's good. And then let's also, you know, parse it out by adding some fan voicemails in between the gifts. That way people can get some gifts. They can hear themselves on our podcast. Yeah. And then they can learn more about this book. I'm loving it. This is this sounds like the perfect structure for, for the show. You actually can't say I'm loving it because that's, um, that's a McDonald's copyright. So I, 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 I just enjoy- would prefer if you didn't just put out corporate taglines. I'm enjoying it. How's that? <laughs> you know, they might own that jingle too, but we're just going to risk it. It's fine. That's the Burger King one. What is the Burger King one? Uh, just Whopper. <laughs> <laughs> All right, before we jump into the gift guide and the voicemails, uh, just a little Walking Dead news. Not a lot this week, but there are now officially odds on who <laughs> is going to survive the cave in The Walking Dead. We Wait. were left off with that cliffhanger, and you know we have to wait till February. So in the meantime, we're going to do some odds. So the odds are just for the people in the cave? Yes. All right, Vegas odds. Vegas odds. Uh, number one is Carol. One to one odds. Fair. That's very fair. Yep. Carol, even though she caused this, she will probably be responsible for the downfall of somebody. Classic Walking Dead. You make your own mistake. You have to live with the ramifications. People die. Next one is Daryl. Four to one odds. That's it. That's fair. Pe- no, I was Daryl's. Daryl's one to one. Oh well, yeah. Daryl is walking out of that cave. He is absolutely. He already signed a contract. I think it's. I mean, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? Who? Well, I do, but. Who knows? I, I think you got to flip them. I think, yeah, d- there's no way Daryl's 4-1 to one while Carol's 1-1. to one. Uh, It's lunacy. I agree. All right, third, Kelly, 10-1 to one odds. Really? Yeah. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Are you just going to respond to everything with, really? I'm sorry. If that, I'm just I'm flabbergasted by these results because and it also makes me sad because I'm like, God, why can't Jerry be a mortal lock to live? But maybe, I don't know, maaybe they're just playing with expectations and Kelly's a goner. I, what, what are the Kelly odds again? 10-1. Uh, 10-1. to one. Okay. For a character who we love her, but has spent a lot of the time crying and being in trouble and losing her hearing, seems like she would be a likely candidate to not survive, but 10 to 1 odds. I guess it's one of those things where like it's the, the person who you think is most likely to go get saved by somebody who then is the person to get killed. I agree. So... Maybe they're maybe they're playing those odds. Well, who is? I'm curious. And don't don't. I'm gonna look away from you as you say it. Who do they think is like absolutely like that person is dead? Who has the worst odds? Uh, worst odds is Aaron with 51 odds. They really think Aaron's gonna die. Yeah, um, I think that's that. I feel like that's about right. Uh, second worst odds is uh, don't you're not gonna. Like I would have said Jerry. It's Jerry Bear. I, Thir- 31 odds. Yeah, I honestly I think you could I think you could swap Aaron and Jerry. And I know you didn't see the uh, Tenby trailer, but it you know there was a moment where Jerry was uh, you know stuck, oh. and he is crying out. But you know they wouldn't show that really unless who knows what they would do. I, again, I do. You do. I know. You're a monster. I know exactly. I can't look at you. What happens for the rest of this podcast? Okay. And then finally, Magna 20 to one odds. Okay. 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 Middle of the road. Sure. So Carol, apparently most safe. Aaron, least safe. Checks out. Uh, I, I think you could have put Jerry at, at Aaron, but I think, um, yeah, that, I, that, that, that seems like pretty safe odds to me. Before we jump in, if you guys want to be part of the voicemail line, we love hearing from you. All you have to do is see our tweet. We usually tweet it out on Monday or Tuesday. We say podcast question of the week in all caps. And all you have to do is leave your name, city, and message at 213 213- Five three six one two seven five. You don't have to leave your city if you don't want to, or you could leave a fake city, and that could really, in case the feds are on your tail or something like that, you know. Leave your name, social security number, Netflix password, and answer to that number. I, I feel like I am legally obligated to say that you can't, you should not do that. Well, yeah. 
Look, I can't get in the way of the bad decisions you're going to make out there, folks, but I'm just telling you, as your not legal advisor, don't do that. Agree to leave just... a voicemail. Don't leave the secret stuff. All right. First one's up. First voicemail is from Charlene. What gift would Charlene give to a Walking Dead character? Hi, my name is Charlene, and I'm from Hope, BC. And the gift I would give would be Elsa's head in a box to Carol. Thank you. Thank you, Charlene. I think that's a great gift. What in what's in the box? It's Alpha's head. Yes. Well done. What are the chances that Gwyneth Paltrow's head makes an appearance in this? Uh, I'd be back shocked half? if we haven't seen it already. It's true. It was just one of those things, like the uh, like in Game of Thrones, they put like George W. Bush's head in a pike at one point, and they're like, "Oh yeah, that's the thing." But I, I'd be shocked if they didn't. All right, our first gift suggestion for you guys. If you guys are into The Walking Dead and you have kids, we have something that might be perfect for them. It is this game called The Walking Dead Something to Fear. It is a card game that features all your favorite characters. And since it is a card game, there's no real graphic violence. You know, it's all pretend. If you're going for some adventurous kids who are not afraid of uh, mortal peril and danger, I think this is this is a, a pretty good a pretty good choice. The the board game itself or the card game itself, the box is rather large. Um, so that will give your kids a feeling of like, oh my gosh, I'm getting something very large. It's a good stuffer underneath the tree. Uh, and I really like the uh, the art is really cool. It's by um, Derek and Lizzie uh, Funkhauser. And wow. uh, Derek works here in the uh, in the office. And uh, he and Lizzie have really uh, knocked this thing out of the out of the park. Now, I recognize that, yes, it's still zombies and I'm sure if you've got little kids, you know, the idea of zombies and talking about the undead apocalypse is, is probably uncomfortable. So let's say you can't do any zombie stuff whatsoever. Well, what would you what would you do if you got to pull something out? We have a branch of our company called Skybound North, and they do a lot of fun animated stuff. And they have controlled this app called My Singing Monsters. It is this kid's app that uh, you have on your phone. And basically, you have different monsters who make different sounds and put them all together and they make a catchy tune. So we have a ton of merch surrounded uh, around that. It's and, super cute. And it's really cute. All you have to do, download the app, get your kids familiar with it, and then buy all their favorite monsters. Now on to another voicemail. I love that we're just doing voicemails right at the top. Like, we're having dessert before dinner. What a time to be alive. On to a next voicemail from Ruth. Hi, my name is Ruth Ann. I live in Columbus Township, Michigan. And my answer would be, I would get the picture that came out of the bar that Miss Schoen and Carol got. It was a picture of Rick, Lori, and Carol. And I would give it to Judith so she could remember what Rick looked like, see her mom and her brother. And then that way she could share it with RJ and he would know what his dad and his brother looks like, and they would always have that. So that is my answer, and I hope it's good enough. All right, thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye. Ruth, that is good enough. Good and enough. That was that. W- that wasn't good enough. That was great. We are. You can't tell from our voice, but we're both sobbing. I'm genuinely touched. That that was lovely. That was lovely. And a lot of people ask about what happened to that tape of Rick, where he was first inducted into Alexandria. And I I also wonder what happened. I'm guessing it got lost in. Some kind of fire during the Negan's attack. I also don't think you want to show like the very first like Rick interview, like you know when uh, when he looks like a werewolf. Exactly when uh, when Negan was looking at the interview, being like, "Oh man, like I don't want to meet that guy. Like if I had met that guy, I would have never messed with you people." Oh yeah, like, yeah. I don't think you want to show that to a kid. Be like, "This was your father. Uh, he uh, killed a man by biting out his jugular." Uh, but but we're alive. But honestly, Ruth, that was. That was lovely. That was poignant. It's, I mean, Ruth is too good for that post-apocalyptic world. You're too good for our podcast, but we'll have you on anyway. Thanks, Ruth. Please but, call in again. Welcome back anytime. On to our next gift. Great voicemail so far. Just moving right along. So we talked about uh, kids' gifts, and I think we really landed that bit. But let's talk about the, the real stuff here. Let's talk about the gifts for the adults. Let's do it. Let's, let's talk about one of my favorite things that we make now. Uh, Spirits of the Apocalypse, the Walking Dead Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Rolls it right off the tongue. We were paid by the word. <laughs> It's a Walking Dead whiskey. How did it take us all of this time to reach this? This should have been like year one. Well, this was years of developing. What's the best flavor? What's the smoothest whiskey you can make? You can literally pour one out for all of the characters that you've lost in the past or for future Sweet Jerry's death, which I'm not going to be happy about. This is, here's the thing. 
I you are not a, a whiskey guy. I'm not. I'm a rum guy, but this is actually good, and I'm not saying that because they're paying me to do so. I wish they paid me to say this stuff. I wish they would give us any of these bottles of whiskey in return for this sweet corporate shill that we actually do mean because it's great. The it taste is. is really good. There's just a hint of sweetness, a little caramel. Um, it's it's great on its own on the rocks with mixers. Like I I advocate its use and use responsibly. Yes, use responsibly, and if you guys want to know where you can pick it up, just go to thewalkingdeadwhiskey.com, and they have all the relevant information for you. And honestly, it's a great gift for your adult friends because it's hard to get people gifts when, unless they're in like some really specific hobby or have been like hinting at an iPad for the last two years. So it's great. People are never going to be unhappy with your gift of this Walking Dead whiskey. I'm not Facebook. I don't have a complex algorithm that can predict all of your hopes, dreams, and fears. So you know what? get them booze people generally like it and also it shows that it's specialized if you know that they like walking dead stuff they're going to be like oh my gosh this is great i didn't know they made a bourbon whiskey and then you're going to be a hit and if they don't like it they're just going to re-gift it to somebody else and that person got bourbon either way somebody wins and i don't get it so i'm jealous all right now on to another voicemail all right this is from angus who i assume is not a hamburger Hi, my name is Angus, and I am from Melbourne in Australia. I would give Judith a present because I think she's a character who would really appreciate it, considering she's having, you know, birthdays and Christmas and whatever. She hasn't really experienced much. I mean, maybe she gets stuff for her birthday. I don't know. You'd have to ask Michonne. Um, But I would definitely give her the Walking Dead comics as a book uh, or as a gift. Um, because I think it would give a little bit of insight into what's to come and what she should be worried about, you know. Um, well, considering Rick's not there anymore, who she should be worried about that might die, you know, anyone like that. I think that, uh, the, yeah, the Walking Dead comics would be very useful as a present for Judith. Angus, that's a really creative voicemail. I really like that. Um, I'm not sure how that would work. I think there's some interdimensional play that would have to occur for someone to gift her the story that is happening. I think she would like get like partway through because she doesn't remember Tyrese or anything. So she's, you know, probably reading it like, oh, this seems kind of familiar. And then she starts seeing Michonne and Rick and all these people. And she's like, wait a minute. Who are, who are these folks? But I don't, Dante is a nice person here, but Dante was a spy. And once the story starts to really deviate from like how like Judith life is going into like the books and everything. And then I think at that point she'd be like, oh, this is deeply confusing. But to your point of like, how would you actually do that in, uh, in Invincible? Uh, Invincible is traveling through a bunch of different dimensions uh, thanks to a dimension hopping villain and he actually winds up in like the Walking Dead verse for like half a second. Whoa, that's crazy. Yeah, so it would be possible and he also like reads a bunch of comic books so he could have like accidentally like dropped a trade paperback or something like that. Wow. I mean, what what an interesting hook. I think Angus has pitched another spinoff series. Great, love it. Thank you, Angus. Good job. Great voicemail so far. You know, we've, we've, done, the, we've done the kids, we've done the, we've done the booze, and now, can we get into something that's actually healthy and promotes excellent life choices, by which I mean video games? Yes. You know how video games lead everybody to be better people? Every time. Yeah, exactly. So we want to talk just for a second about uh, Telltale's The Walking Dead, the definitive series. We've talked about it a couple times uh, in briefly on the, uh, on the show, but it's great. It's uh, every single season of Telltale's The Walking Dead, uh, plus the Michonne uh, DLC, plus the 400 Days DLC that went for uh, season one. It's got developer's commentary. It's got the uh, original soundtrack. It's got a character gallery. It's got a behind-the-scenes documentary that I produced, so it's middling to poor. Um, so wait, this is kind of like how Game of Thrones is now promoting you can get all the seasons in like one bundle, and you're saying I can get all the Telltale ones, even... Like the one, the Michonne ones. Yeah, you can get literally every every playable second of The Walking Dead made by Telltale is available in this in this series. And for anyone who doesn't know, can you give like a ten second like description of what Telltale's The Walking Dead game is? Oh gosh, I'll I'll do my best. Ten uh, seconds. I'm timing you and go. Telltale's The Walking Dead is a uncompromising tale of growing up in the uh, zombie apocalypse. That first follows this guy Lee, who finds this little girl Clem and teaches her how to be a person in the apocalypse, and things go great. All right, that's it. It's a real laugh fest. No, I'm just kidding. It's very dire, and everybody cries at the end of season one, but it's great. Um, it's honestly, I've been looking out, and it's uh, it's on a bunch of like really reputable places, uh, game of the decade list. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, so um, you can pick it up, find out what all these folks are talking about, 
And uh, yeah, invest some, some time in your life in one of the best video games ever made. Right up there with Knack 2. And uh, and for folks who are really interested in, uh, it's sorry, r- ran right past that one. <laughs> and for folks who have been looking out on this, I know we just put a thing out. If you ordered or pre-ordered any of the collector's editions, so that's the Protectors Pack, the Guardian, uh, etc. Uh, I'm holding on to Disco Broccoli right now in my hands, and I'm looking at the finished Lee and Clem statue. And those things will be going out the week of January 26. We put a thing out on Friday about it, but if you missed it and you're listening to this podcast. That's your information. I know it, it took a while, but you're getting all this stuff in the end of January. And it is great looking. That is incredible. All right, we're gonna do we're gonna play our last voicemail question. What would you give to a Walking Dead character as a gift? Let's go. For Chris, this is Amy from Tallahassee, and for Christmas, I would give Carol a day at the spa. Thank you, Amy from Tallahassee. That is a excellent gift. Yeah, that that just that just keeps on giving. And you know what? There's so you're spending all of your time out in the grime hunting for your food. Well, what a nice day to get to get some uh, a nice facial, mani pedis, maybe a nice little hot stone. I, I just get the works. I agree. And uh, if anyone needs a spa day, it's Carol. And oh, yeah. if anyone needs a bath, it's Daryl. And dog. Let's not kid ourselves. Dog has never been washed. <laughs> dog has never been washed, but he's doing so great. For those of you wondering. Living his best dog life. All right. So now we are going to move on to our special guest of the week. Woody, take it away. Our next guest is a very prolific and award-winning writer who has authored many books since 2013, including the breakout hit trilogy Lives of Tao, for which he won an Alex Award in 2014 and the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Author in 2015. He's midway through another trilogy called Time Salvager. Most recently, he wrote a terrific book that I reviewed in an earlier episode called The Walking Dead Typhoon. His name is Wesley Chu. He has been sitting patiently through this entire introduction, and he joins us now on Talk Dead to Me. Wesley, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm happy to be here. Well, we could give it a minute. All right. I deeply enjoyed uh, Walking Dead Typhoon. I thought you you created a, a whole new world that also felt like it lived within the universe and the rules of the of the Walking Dead. So congratulations, it was it was great. Awesome, thank you. Um, it, it's it's funny because um, when Mike Brapp, the editor at Skybound, first approached me about this project, you know, w- one of the first things he said to me was, "You have a free hand on doing whatever you want, as long as it's Walking Dead." And one of the things is, you know, I've seen you know all the seasons of Walking Dead, and I've read the comics. Yeah. So. I didn't want to rewrite like the exact same thing over and over again about a band of survivors and whatever. So I told Mike, I want to do something as not Walking Dead as can be as long as long as it's still The Walking Dead. And that's kind of he gave me a free hand to do that. And that's what I try to do. So when you say it still feels like The Walking Dead to you, like what is that? What does that mean? What are the universal Walking Dead I mean, what, what what are the universal Walking Dead rules? I yes. mean, A, you know, obviously there's zombies mm-hmm. or walkers or, or whatever, or Jiangxi or whatever they're called. But, you know, it's the the dead, the Walking Dead, they're a force of nature. They're not evil. They are they are just, you know, they're a hurricane. They're a tsunami. They are they are an earthquake. Yeah. So that is what they are. They are a force of nature. Now, one of the tenets of the Walking Dead is – Man is inherently the evil thing. So totally. at the end of the day, whoever your main characters are, they're, the evil that comes at them isn't the dead. It's, it's, it's other mankind. Absolutely. So th- those are like the two main rules that I, I wanted to abide by is, you know, what happens to civilization after everything falls apart because of, of a devastating force of nature? And then how, how, do, how does man react to that? Which is kind of, you know, similar to like what happened in the United States, you know. Good people do bad things, and bad people rise. But the thing that I loved was how you were building like the the strategies and the structures that the humans had built. So like the way that they get around by being up instead of on the ground. Like how how did you ideate that? Was there something that you went on like a trip and you were like that really inspires me? How did that come together? I mean, the, the first thing that inspired me was like you know Chinese like China's geography. Mm-hmm. I mean that that place is a Amazing. Have you ever been to Western China? You know, like the precipitous pillars and everything. It it looks like Avatar yeah. in, on, on, in, in many places. And then some of their cities are like a thousand years old. 
So there was so much to play with. And once I started looking, going through pictures and then you know, looking at places I've been to and, you know, just following videos, it kind of kind of jumps out at you because, again, I want to do something that's, you know, not what's already been done in Walking Dead while still being Walking Dead. And after seeing, you know, the, the TV show and Fear the Walking Dead and read the comics, you know, it, it, it allowed me to kind of like, okay, how can these people do things differently than what's already been done? Yeah. So the the win team that you had of uh, Zhu, Alina, and Bo also felt just like really there wasn't a Rick Grimes to be seen. I mean the the police character uh, Heng Yun, Heng Yun, yeah, Heng Yun. I'm sorry, uh, he's a little Rick Grimey. A little I, Rick I, Grimes. I, I, I'll buy that. Yeah, but I thought, but the win team that you had put together. I mean, tell me a little bit about how you formed that uh, that triumvirate. Oh, you know what? I think I started with Zhu, and you know, it's like you know, I, I wanted him to be. You know, a, a more of a, a village type guy. Yeah. And then I just kind of built around him because you know the zoo, you know, really like the the farm the farm kid who goes to the city to work in a factory is a very common story in China. So I built his character. And then I I wanted to add Elena who was more like you know in many ways because the uh, typhoon's built for an American audience. Right. I wanted that kind of Western viewpoint. Totally. And 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 um, somebody who goes to China to like. You know, do do their do their um, their, their skip year mm -hmm. in college or teaching English is a very common thing. So I wanted very normal people to kind of come together, and you know, and then the big goofy bow guy. Just <laughs> I just kind of like big goofy guys. He's the best. Yeah, yeah. Um, and everybody's got a friend like that. You know, a dependable big guy who's strong and you know, kind kind of kind of kind of doofy. Yeah, happy to be there. Yeah. Just the, but like the beating heart of the group yeah. too at the same time. How do you tell an American audience about this different like cultural experience? I mean, that was, that was the fun part. I mean, um, when I first, you know, got the assignment, I did a lot of research, you know, writing an outline to show um, Mike Braff and Robert Kirkman. And th what the first thing I did was was I looked for the differences between the two two cultures. You know, in the U.S., you know, there there are like five guns for every person, while yeah. in China there's like a hundred people per gun. Yeah. And then you know, you look at where we come from. You know, I I lean heavily on elements of the Cultural Revolution. And just how they view society and how they view, like, you know, like working as a group versus how the more individualism that, that you know, people in, the, in America have. Totally. So I looked at all these things and just kind of put them all together. I leaned on them really heavily and then just kind of let them, like, grow out, you know? Yeah. When I was, like, creating scenes about, like, back in the, at the Beacon where they're having these, like, these slogans being chanted, yep. I pulled, like, actual. <clears throat> actual cultural revolution quotes. And I tried to modify them a little bit, made them still feel very like cultural revolution, yeah. but just, you know, referring to, to Jiangxi. They're, they're playing the hits. Yeah, they're playing But they're the hits. updating it for, for today's audience type right. thing. That's excellent. So tell me a little bit how you actually got to this point because you've been making, you've been writing books since 2013. You, uh, with the Lives of Tao trilogy, uh, the Time Salvagers trilogy that you're midway through. Was this something where like, they called you up and said, hey, you know, we've got a great opportunity. How did that all come together? So publishing is pretty tiny. You know, spec fiction, you know, science fiction fantasy mm -hmm. is really, really small. So it's really? a very small community of, in terms of like, traditional publishing. So um, Mike Braff is an editor that I've known for probably, you know, four or five years before, you know, we've worked together. And I've always wanted to work with him. So when he came to Skybound, um, and he called me up one day. He was like, hey, you know, I want to get this project, Walking Dead in Asia. I'm going to give you a really long leash. Are you interested? And I'm a huge Walking Dead fan, yeah. and I always wanted to work with Mike. So it all kind of worked, came together really well for me. I mean, at first I was like, I'm kind of a busy guy, and <laughs> I wasn't expecting to write a book. I know a book takes a while to write. But then the more, then like after I told Mike, you know, let me, let me think about it, you know, that night I just started thinking about like, okay, what would happen if a bunch of walkers walked around China? Uh -huh. You know, China has a billion people at the time. You know, the, the walk the walkers came out. So, how does that affect the population dynamics? How do the guns affect it? How does the the you know the more heavy hand of the government affect it? You know, how does kung fu affect it? Yeah. So, so all these things kind of popped into my head. And over the past week, you know, I was thinking about it. I wrote a couple of notes down, talked to my agent, and my agent was like, "Hey, you know, you're kind of busy." <laughs> and then I said, "You know what? I really want to work with Mike." I love Walking Dead. Let's let's just make it happen, and and we did. You know, we we kind of massaged the schedule a little bit. We kind of worked through it. No, mix a few things around, and there there we go. I, I imagine there's quite a few Time Salvager fans who are like, "No, dude, we need that third book. Come on, man." Yeah, Time Salvager three is pretty delayed. <laughs> not, not gonna lie. We're we're not gonna go into it here. We're not gonna we're not gonna poke that bear. Um, 
But tell me, I mean, you've had an incredible decade just looking after... Uh, so you were, before you were a full-time author, you were doing the whole like nine to five, punch in, punch out in a cubicle and like slowly going insane. That sounds about right, yeah. <laughs> and I think that was, you were saying in interviews, that was part of the the basis for your first book, uh, Lives of Tao. I mean, so I mean, so what happened was, um, you know, I, I've always been an avid reader as a kid, you know, and when, when I was 16, I I told my dad, you know, dad, I'm, I'm going to be an English major. I'm going to write books for a living. And my father, who was an English professor, was like, no, son. <laughs> Your life will suffer. And that's exactly what he said. Yeah. So I did. I became a computer science major and went, did all that thing. And then like 20 years later, I'm like, ah, I showed you. I'm doing this now. <laughs> and, um, and so he was very much against me actually becoming a full-time writer. And even as early as like, the, like 2016, he was like, son, I got you an interview at the Chase Bank, you know, or stuff like that. <laughs> and I'm like, man, what the heck, man? <laughs> I, I just won the, the John just, W. Campbell I Award here, Dad. This, this and, is... you know, I, I made list this year. So, but you know what? It, it is what it is. Um, in hindsight, it took me like 20 years to kind of like correct that mistake yeah. of coming back to writing. But who knows? I don't know what could have happened if I became an English major. I could have become an English major and ended up teaching like, you know, junior high English and got burned out. Sure. Yeah, so... So there's something to be said about, you know, if you love something enough, regardless of your education, you can always come back to it sure. if you work hard enough. Yeah. I think there are a lot of people listening who or who are also on that journey being like, oh, man, I want to go and do that thing or, you know, I would love to get, turn this hobby into a profession type thing. At what point did you did you tell yourself, like, we're going to we're going to do it. We, we've got it. So so before I start, uh, try to uh, write my first book, I used to like, go to go to work. Then I would go work out, and then I'd like train in like kung fu for like three hours a night. I mean, li- I was training for like twenty hours a week. Wow! And then at one point, I was like, "Man, I got no girlfriend. I got no life. All I do is train, and I'm not even really happy." <laughs> so, and then that's when I realized, and like, I went back to like you know when I was sixteen years old, and like I wanted to write a book. So I was like, "Maybe I'll write a book." And then once I really got serious with it, um, something had to go. So I actually, I, I quit martial arts to write books. No kidding. Yeah. So, I mean, even though I spent like 20 hours a week, you know, literally 50 weeks a year training, I literally just dropped it and I went and then I did everything, I put everything into writing books. Wow. And then, you know, that, and then I wrote nonstop from 2005 to 2007. And then I quit for like two, three years because I was playing World of Warcraft. <laughs> You know, as, as you do, we, I, I, yep. I, I was a raid leader and shit. Look, like, that's that's a that takes time. You gotta that do doesn't so, just happen. You know what? Nothing teaches good project management like being a raid leader. I love that. Yeah, that is because it's it's one thing to to like try to like wrangle like you know five employees who are getting paid to listen to you. Yeah, it's another thing to like handle like 150 like pubescent kids who want like like epic loots. Oh my god! I mean, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah, and I learned so much just like you know being a raid officer. So then that, and then eventually, you know, I realized that, oh my God, I'm playing World of Warcraft like 20 hours a week, 30 hours a week. <laughs> yep. so, and then that's when I got back to writing. And then in, you know, in 2012, I sold my first, sold Lives of Tao and then came on 2013 and we're off to the races then. Yeah. So now, I mean, you're, you're doing it full time. Do you, do you still, I mean, you said in 2016, you're, while you were mid stride in being a full time author, your dad was like, Hey, I got you a, an interview at a bank. Do you still have to defend this career path to your folks or is it, is it fine now? I mean, they're cool now, I guess. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's like, you know, yeah, we're, we're doing okay now. I mean, I think my parents, I mean, here's the thing about publishing is it's not the most stable industry. You know, I mean, you could be doing really well today, but you're, you're literally like one bad book away from like being unemployed. Wow. So, so it is, a, I mean, if you look at like, you know, my debut class in 2013, I would say that 90% of them aren't publishing anymore. Wow. I don't know that's true or not, but it sounds like it feels like it's true. Sure. And if you look at the ones who have been, you know, publishing for a long time, you know, the George R. R. Martin, you know, Robin Hobbs, there's only a couple of them. You know, the attrition rate is, is insanely high. That is wild. So so I, I gotta do what I'm like forty three now, so I gotta work till what? Seventy five. <laughs> and I'm sure people are like, oh, in, in, in writing this economy. A book, right? That's I don't know, man. That's, is that do I have another thirty, forty books left in me? I'm like, yeah. I would wager yes. I mean, you you seem to the way that you talk about your process or your inspiration that you got from uh, from Lives of Tao and then also for Time Salvager, which by the way, the premise of Time Salvager is amazing. 
with time travelers who go back like seconds or instants before uh, a giant disaster and go and take all of these things to preserve them and then zip right back and let the explosion cover them. Genius. Yeah, that was a that was a drug fueled dream. <laughs> I mean, James Cameron came up with Terminator in a literal fever dream. So was I think. That, well, I mean, okay, it, it was a, it was a, it was a chantix dream. I was actually trying to quit smoking at the time. Oh boy! But the chantix is a great anti-smoking drug, but it also gives you like, these crazy vivid dreams. <laughs> and I basically dreamt that I was on the Titanic and it was sinking, and I and I was like trying to steal the Hope Diamond, and 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 I knew everybody was gonna die, uh-huh. but I couldn't do anything about it because that's not what I'm here for. Yeah. And then right when I was about to get the diamond, I woke up and I'm like, wow, that should be a book. This is a fantastic Chantix commercial. Yeah, I know. I, this is Ray Liotta has been selling us the a, a false bill of goods. This is this is the money maker for Chantix. Call me up, Chantix. We'll, <laughs> we'll figure it out. So so beyond going into a deep Chantix uh, induced hallucination, like what's your what's your process? How do you do? How do you structure your day? I mean, poorly. I, it's, it's, <laughs> it's probably the right answer. But um, I mean, it's I'm a full time writer now, so I work at home. So um, I used before I had kids, I used to you know get up whenever I wanted to get up. Mm-hmm. I'd write till like you know, 2 a.m. And it, it'd be like an 18-hour day. And, you know, I'd probably play a bunch of, you know, World of Warcraft or, or, <laughs> or, or like Dota in between. Sure. But now that I have two kids, um, it, it ain't that way anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it's, it's basically you, you write when you can. And, yep. you know, at the end of the day, you have to learn to write more efficiently. Sure. You know, there's there's no more screwing around. Do you um, – have you gone back to, to Kung Fu since you, since you dropped it or – No, dude. Oh, man. No, no, no. Here's the thing: is like, like when you used to like when you're 20 mm-hmm. and you get punched in the head, you're like, that's a good punch, <laughs> you know. But when you're 30 or 35 oh. and you get punched in the head, that's a concussion. No, thank you. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, you know, I want to be able to play ball with my kids and stuff. So I mean, like, like <laughs> kung fu is actually tough on your knees. Really? Yeah, and it's tough on your head too. So like I, I just do CrossFit now. That's smart. Yeah, yeah. I, I took about two weeks of Krav Maga and then I threw up during one session and I was like, "That's enough for me." <laughs> I think if we've reached the end of that. Wait, wait, is it because you were sparring or because you were you were uh, getting your ass kicked? Uh, it was a little column A, a little bit of column B, yeah. and a little bit of just uh, Krav Maga is fun. I, I I like it. It's but yeah, you'll, you'll throw up. Yeah, it, it's a it's a whole different thing. I mean, it's a young you, man's if game. You, if you haven't thrown up, then you're not trying hard enough. Exactly. And I was like, this this seems like a whole lot of effort. I'm not sure discipline. Yeah, but is it's the... definitely a young man's game. Totally. Uh, does your creativity just come to you naturally, or do you have things that you do to try to try to rile it up? Uh, no, dude. I mean, you know, there, there's a lot of authors who they have like 500 ideas, uh-huh. and whenever they write a book, they just kind of pluck one out, and then that's that's their next book. Sure. I have like three ideas, maybe two, and then I, I hold on to it for like you know. That's the only idea I got. So uh-huh. if, whenever I get around to it, you know, that it's fully baked in my head. Um, the current series I'm working on right now is called The War Art Saga. And we, we just sold it to Del Rey, and, you know, I'm really excited to work on it. And I've been wanting to write this series since 2014. Wow. You know, but at the time, I literally did not have the confidence or the skill or the experience to write it. So it took, like, you know— 10 books yeah, and you know, making lists and everything before I finally sat down this year and go, okay, I think I'm ready to write this thing. So, that's, that's crazy to me that somebody who has authored you know, over 10 books and finally is like, okay, now I feel like I'm good enough. No, this, this, this one's been, this, is, this, this book is like the reason I, I exist is I'm going to write the series. So. That's wild. So by the time you finish that, do you think you'd be like, oh, that, that's all of me on the page? I'm done. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I am going to go retire now. No, no, I mean, it's, I'm sure by the time I finish a series, which is going to take about three three years, um, I'll have something else. Be, I'll have a new passion project I want to work on. But you know, this is the one. This is a basically the War Saga is um, it's my love letter to kung fu. Ooh! So it's, it's basically like you know, like the the Choi Hawk, the the uh, uh, Wu flick. Oh right! So I'm I'm reading a kung fu epic. Um, it's funny because the past couple of years, um. I talk to all my peers, and I'm like, well, what are you working on these days? And everybody's trying, they're writing, like, important books, you know, yeah. science fiction that kind of reflects our, our culture or our politics, right. you know, gender dynamics, you know, racism. So th- a lot of people are writing about stuff like that. And they're like, what are you, what are you doing, Wes? I'm going to write a kung fu book. <laughs> you know, but whatever. That's what I want to write, so uh, screw you all. I, you know? No, I think you're, you're right on with that because, yeah. look, for everybody who's like, this is an important tome that's going to, you know, heal the fractures of whatever – that's fine, 
but I feel like I could only read like one to one and a half of those before I'm like, I get it. Life is incredibly hard. I would like to have a good time with a book. I mean, occasionally. I think a lot. I mean, these important books are are great, and they really. And, and I mean, science fiction is often a, a reflection of, of our culture. Yes. But but for me, just you know, my heart wanted to write a kung fu book. Yeah. And no matter how much you know, I thought about other ideas that I could work on. I'm like, oh, I want to write is a kick ass kung fu book. Yeah. You gotta you gotta write for you first, right? Exactly. exactly yeah. If so. you're not having fun, it's gonna show up on the yeah. page, and it's gonna be like, yeah, he just struggled through this thing. So I, that that's right on. Um, about how long do you think it takes you from like the ideation of like I've got it to here's a rough draft? Oh my god, I've sent this out. Well, I mean, so I mean, War Arts has been has taken me like five years just to even think about it. But um, usually when it comes to writing, say like Typhoon, for example, sure. you know, I spent a good week writing initial outline. You know, and it was a big outline. It was like probably you know forty, fifty pages. Wow. No, maybe not that many, but it's it it a big outline. And the thing about outlining is, I'm a big outliner. I love to outline exactly what's going on. Yeah. But then I also love to have my characters make decisions. You know, an outline is great huh. until you give your characters free will. <laughs> yep. And once you give them free will, you have to kind of you can either force them to do what you want them to do, mm -hmm. or you let them do what they want to do. Yeah. So what happens is like my my outlines jump the rails. Um, I'll have like. They'll be coming along the outline, and then they make a decision that I didn't think they were going to make, but I let them do it. So my outline goes from, like, version 1.0 to, like, 1.3, and 1.5, 1.9. Yeah. And by the time I finish the book, um, I'm on version, like, 7.3. Huh. So I'm always re-outlining because I want them to make, you know, to make choices. That's great. Even in Typhoon, um, we initially let uh, left the ending open-ended. We kind of, like, you know, not open-ended. We, 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 it was like a two-year-old adventure almost where – Certain things could have happened, mm -hmm. and we just let it let let it go. Yeah. So, um, we let them make certain decisions at the very end. You know, we let the characters make the ones that felt right for everybody. At the, you know, in in the epilogue, the ending also felt like a Walking Dead type thing, where it was it was uncompromising. Not all of these folks can be allowed to make it out type deal. Right. But you but you do allow certain characters to survive who I thought would never make it in a million years. And it's also like life goes on. Yes. You know, it's just kind of the end of the comic. It's like, life went on. It wasn't a happy, and no one won. Yeah. There's no, like, victory. You know, we didn't, like, you know, like, there's no, like, parade at the very end where, like, <laughs> you know, putting on medals at all the, at, like, at the end of Star Wars. Totally. But, like, it just, all right, well, what happens next? Yeah, it's it's just a Tuesday. Yeah, it's just and, a Tuesday. And we're just going to keep going on yeah. here. So when you reach the, to jump the rails a little bit and, and talk about The Walking Dead, when you reach the end of the comic, how did how did you feel? Well, I mean, it's one of those things where you're like, you're like, you get to the end of the comic, you're like, huh? <laughs> Did this just end? And then you go back a few pages, yep. you reread a few, reread everything, and mm -hmm. he goes, huh? And then like, and I'm like, and then after, I remember, I remember, I finished a comic, and I kind of sat down, I had dinner, and I was like, huh? <laughs> and then I think I, I, uh, I, I texted Mike Braff. I'm like, Mike, is, is this the end? Can you ask Sean if this is the end? <laughs> and then, and that was it. That that was the end. And we're like, all right, you know. And and in, in some ways. That was the most fitting and poetic ending for The Walking Dead. Yes. It's like, you know, a couple hundred issues of, of the comic, and, you know, you, then you fast forward a little bit, and that's it. You don't need closure. I mean, the closure is in the fact that life goes on. Yes. And I really love that. I love that about The Walking Dead, because if they had something else, it would have felt, you know, not right for, for no. Yeah, a little artificial. Yeah, artificial, yeah, yeah. because... I mean, you look at how how much of the the characters have just like you know, here are the ones that died, here's the ones that continued on, mm -hmm. and no matter who dies, you no know, life goes on. But I mean, it also it it makes you think about it. It makes you yes. think about like, okay, so so what does Carl do next? Yeah. And I mean, it's open ended enough that we could technically revisit it if you ever want to come back with something, either another comic or sure. a TV show or whatever. But it's it's the right kind of closure. Yeah. You know, not everything needs to fit nicely in a bow. And I agree. Especially Walking Dead never fits nicely in a boat. Yeah. Starting off, what is the what is the writer's journey like? I mean, so, so here's the thing about writing that's that's different from most other professions. Okay, in most other fields, the more you work at it, the better you you get at it, mm -hmm. and the more confident you feel about it. Um, that's not the case with writing. In writing. Every book that I'm working hard on is the hardest book I've ever written. Wow. Like, even though you're getting better at your craft, you don't feel it. 
Okay, part of it's because you're, you're stretching yourself because anytime you get too confident with your writing where you feel like, oh, this is easy, you're probably not writing well. Yeah. So so we, we always feel, and this is not just me, this is probably most professional writers, and we feel this like, like, we feel most of the time that we don't know what we're doing. Huh. And that's fine. That's just the way it is. So, so initially, when I first started writing, um, you know, I I go to work, go to the gym, and then I'd go to the cafe and, and write for like three, four hours. And the thing about sitting down and writing for three, four hours is, you need to train yourself to do that. Hmm. You know, you don't you don't just sit down for three, four hours every day and start writing. You have to like you start at one hour, two hours, whatever. But not only that, it's it's you have to keep your attention span. Yeah. So what I did was I'd go to the cafe, I'd sit down, I'd order dinner, I would write, and I would play part like I would play online poker. At the same time, nice. And all that ha- all that meant was like, you know, after six months, all that happened was I had a lot of spelling errors and I lost a lot of money. In poker. <laughs> but it trained me to sit down for three four hours at a time to write. Huh. As opposed to like the the times that you'd be leading a raid in World of Warcraft, this is something where you're more like singularly focusing your mind on this, like and training your mind to do this task. I mean, it's not intentional. You just kind of do it. Like World of Warcraft, I want to be there. Yeah. But like you know, my, my my head wants to be there. But when I'm writing. Like my head wants to do something else all the time. Yeah. So that's that's the training that you got to put into it. Is you know how do you stay in a story? How do you focus on it? And 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 writing it is exhausting. So how do you build a stamina to kind of you know put yourself in that those four hour segments? Do you think any of your uh, learning and training in kung fu helped with like learning this new skill set towards uh, towards writing? Not really. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. Not really. I mean, k- kung fu is fun. Sure. You know? even, even even like the crabby stuff, like you know, do a horse dance for five minutes. That sucks, but it's also kind of fun. Yeah. You know, there's and and writing is fun, but for something that's fun, my head really wants to not do it all the time. Yeah, that makes sense. So, is the you were mentioning that the 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 best guys are like only one or two like real heavyweights, and then the and the community is, uh, of authors is actually quite small. Do you find that that's a, uh, is that a, a supportive community or is everybody kind of like standoffish and is like, you know, hating on everybody's book or how does that work? No, that's, that's not the case. Um, I mean, I think like I, I know most of the authors mm-hmm. in, in my genre you know? and, you know, we're, a lot of us are on Twitter. We all hang out at conventions and comic cons and I would say the vast majority of us are our friends. You know, Excellent. we, we know how hard the business is. We know the attrition rate that happens with the business. We know how hard it is to keep publishing. Yeah. You know, every time you publish a book, you know, you, you're still alive. You're 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 still kicking right there. You yeah. know, so so we're generally very supportive of each other because you know it's it's a small world and you know rising tide lifts all ships. I agree. Well, this is great, uh, Wesley. Thank you so much again. We love the book. Everybody has to go and read it. It's terrific. Uh, thank you so much for for being on the podcast. Awesome, man. Thanks for having me. Wow, that was a great interview, Woody. Thank I'm you. I'm actually surprised. Giving you the reins this week, I was a little nervous, and you kind of knocked it out of the park. Well, you. It's important to show them a, a photograph of their uh, of their home, mm. and then black and white pictures of their loved ones. That's nice. Yeah. Okay. Let's, just to let them know that I've done a lot of prep. Yeah. And I've I've researched them. Would you say Walking Dead Typhoon is on the gift guide? I would say it's probably number one in my holiday gift guide. Nice. Seriously, it's great. Either for to give somebody or if you're traveling across the country to go see somebody and you want to have that plane ride or whatever, just like pass within like just seconds, pick up the book. It's great. It really moves. I, I absolutely recommend it. This guy, he's a very, very talented author. That's awesome. And where can people get this? Uh, store.skybound.com oh yeah is the is the destination for all of your Walking Dead gift needs that is a catchy website store.skybound.com that's the unofficial jingle it's work for hire speaking of store.skybound.com we have a lot of amazing amazing products for you guys to get for yourself or for a loved one uh, this holiday season I would personally recommend the game Pitch Storm it's our new card game if you're into like Cards Against Humanity it's in that same vein we partnered with Side Night and Happiness you love those guys and we made this hilarious game where you kind of have to make these Sophie's Choice decisions of who would get hit by a trolley and it's a lot of fun if you need a new party game. And I think we all do. I think we're all tired of Cards Against Humanity at this point. Oh, gosh. Yeah, there's only – also, like, you can't play Cards Against Humanity with your parents. Like, No, because, like, you think you took out all the bad cards, but then, like, Queef comes up, and then you're like, oh, my God. And then you're explaining to your mom, and yeah. it's a lot. I right? don't need to know that they were that they were people before. 
But for all the other gifts we have, uh, go to store.skybound.com, guys. We have Lucille pens. We have Lucille bats. We have all the comics that you're interested in. We have so many things. Just go there, and we have a ton of holiday sales, too, so go ahead and check it all out. Compendiums. Trade paperbacks. We've got gold. We got frankincense. Do we have myrrh? We do have myrrh. Oh, thank God. What is myrrh? It doesn't matter. Okay, well, we got it. (laughs) And we have a limited (laughs) supply. (laughs) And that wraps up this episode of Talk Dead to Me. Thank you guys so much for tuning in uh, for our little short podcast to get some gift ideas, to get some Wesley Chu information. Yep, thanks, everybody. And also remember to uh, pick us up on all the major podcast networks. And don't forget to rate us five stars. If this is your first time, we really appreciate it. If you are just sharing the the gift of our voices, you're a strange person, but we appreciate it. And next week, we're going to be off the corporate shill, and we're going to be on to a retrospective of the Walking Dead comics. All right. We're going to have Editor-in-Chief Sean Makowitz with us. I know that guy. He's going to answer all of our questions about the past, present, and future of the Walking Dead. You probably Perfect. won't answer the future. Probably not. Probably will be very tight-lipped about it. And, uh, and that's it for me. Happy birthday, Nate. Happy birthday, Nate. So anyway, I looked up, uh, I googled myrrh. It's a sap-like substance. Like a resin? Yeah, myrrh is used to make medicine. Med- like old-timey medicine. It's like old-timey medicine. Like when you would uh, put a bug on someone's forehead, like you don't have a cold anymore. Oh, yeah, or they like leached all of the blood from George Washington's body. Did they ever find those leeches? Like, can you clone him? Yeah, no, that's the, uh, you know, interestingly enough, that's the uh, plot point of National Treasure 3. <laughs> <laughs>